Marcy Bernice, and I am I'm so excited to be here tonight with you guys. Um, how fun is it that we like, we are learning from the comfort of our own home right now? I just I think that that is so incredibly awesome. So before we get started, I just kind of want to tell you a little bit about myself and who I am as an educator. So I am a second grade teacher turned work at home mom here in the state of Texas. I taught for eight years. Two of those years were spent in first grade and then the last six years were spent in second grade. Um, during my time in second grade, three of those years I spent just teaching second grade math. Um, I have a wonderful husband and two daughters. One is three years old and my youngest is gonna be six months old next week. I'm kind of like in denial about that a little bit, but that's okay. Um, so after having my youngest daughter last November, I decided to take this school year off so that I could stay home and be with my little girls, but I'm still heavily involved in the education world. So I am the author behind SaddleUpForSecondGrade.com, and I also sell educational resources on Teachers Pay Teachers. And another fun, exciting thing that I get to do is I get to travel and present with an education company called um, SDE, also known as Staff Development for Educators. I have been a presenter with them for the past five years, and I, I love getting to travel and share my passion for teaching um, with educators all over the US. So um, I do want to mention that you're gonna hear me reference second grade a lot tonight just because I was a second grade teacher. But there, if you are not a second grade teacher, there are going to be lots of, that, lots of valuable information that you can take back and implement into your classroom. So a lot, if, if you hear me like reference a specific resource or something like that, that is going to be something that you can easily kind of change out to use your own materials within your grade level. But most of the information that I'm going to be shared is just going to be basic that can work across grade levels um, and that you can take away with you today. So if you're ready, I want you to grab a piece of paper, grab a cute flare pen, and let's get started. Are you ready? All right, here we go. All right, so you are in the right place today. If you are wanting to begin or implement guided math groups, maybe you are currently trying to teach small group math, but you're not sure how it works or how it functions. So you're in the right place if you are ready to get started and learn more about that. You're also in the right place if you are looking for ways to set up and create meaningful and engaging activities to use in your classroom. We're going to be talking about planning and organizing all your materials and keeping up with all that fun data that you know we have to take care of. And you're in the right place if you are looking for solutions to store all of your materials. So these are the three questions that I get asked most when it comes to teaching small group math. So let me kind of backtrack just for a second. I am a firm believer that miracles can happen at the small group table. I think that it is so important that we need to be giving our kids targeted and individualized instruction. And so it is my goal here today to give you some resources and tips and ideas to start that type of instruction. So these are the three concerns that I get the most is one, how can you create meaningful activities each, each week? I'm gonna walk you through and I'm gonna show you a, um, several ideas that I use in my classroom. Some are gonna involve some kind of prep work and some are gonna involve very little prep. Then I'm gonna walk you through how you can keep your students on task. And then we're gonna talk about how you manage everything. How are you gonna keep your students on track? How do you keep up with all of the materials and the paperwork? So we're gonna be talking about all of those things today. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is setting up your math block and how you can organize it 
to teach small group math and fit that into your schedule. So the first thing I am going to recommend, and I'm sure as teachers, we all know this, but it's just a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just a friendly reminder is that you have to be flexible because you are going to have interruptions during your small group time, just like you're going to have with anything else. You're gonna have an unplanned fire drill or you're gonna have that mom that always walks in with a tray of cupcakes and didn't let you know that they were coming. You're always going to have something like that. There are going to be days when you get to all of your groups and then there's gonna be days where you may not even see a single one. You just have to know that that is okay. And so my advice that I give to everyone um, that I talk to and I speak with is, um, I may not get to everything every day when it comes to teaching small group math, but every day I try, and that is the most important part. So I am going to walk you through some example schedules. I'm gonna show you some examples using a 90 minute math block, and then I'm going to show you some examples using a 60 minute math block. I have um, I've taught in districts where I've used both of these time frames, so I know how difficult it can be if you don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to kind of walk you through and show you that. So if you are not familiar with guided math, it's based on um, three different components. It um, focuses on a warm up then you're going to have a whole group mini lesson followed by your math station rounds i call them math stations some people call them math centers i've just i've always called them stations so if you hear me say that word and you're used to hearing centers you know what i'm talking about so your whole group lesson needs to be in this is, let me backtrack again sorry first i'm going to talk about a 90 minute math block so your whole group lesson is going to need to be anywhere from about 20 to 30 minutes. And then this is what I personally did. So this right here that you're seeing, this was my actual schedule that I used last year. I had three rounds of math stations. Each round was 15 minutes each. And then I allowed five minutes to take a quick brain break. So we might um, stand up and stretch. We might do um, something from Go Noodle just to kind of get their um, to keep their brains focused. So I normally do that kind of in the middle of my block just to make sure that they are constantly engaged. So here are two different examples if you have a 90 minute math block. So each example includes a five minute warm up activity. For your warm up, this can be anything from maybe you do a number of the day you do a word problem of the day, or you do some sort of quick little game that is going to cover a previously taught skill. Followed by a 20 minute whole group lesson. Now the difference between these two sample schedules is the amount of time that your um, rotations include. So you can do either four 15 minute rotations, or you can choose to do five 10 minute rotations. Me personally, I have always stuck with 15 minutes. I have never, I've never felt like I could squeeze in all of the content that I needed to be teaching to my students in 10 minutes. But I know teachers who can get it all done in 10 minutes. And if you are one of those teachers, like power to you, because I've never been able to do that, but it is doable. And then after, um, our station time is over, I either will do a five to 10 minute reflection. And this is where we come back together whole group and we talk about what we've learned that day. I kind of let students share their experiences and I will, I'm gonna show you some examples of how I do that later on. Here are two different examples if you have a 60 minute math block. And if you have um, a time that isn't 90 or 60 minutes, you'll just kind of have, have to adjust um, as needed. But again, so I'm gonna have a five minute warm up followed by a 20 minute whole group lesson. And then if you have a 60 minute math block, you can do two 15 minute rotations or you can do three 10 minute rotations followed by a five minute reflection. 
And then that extra five minutes um, that you're seeing there is allowed that time for a brain break. And then you can also do something called power hour. I know teachers who do to choose who choose to do this type of teaching all the time. I like to do this sometimes maybe towards the end of a unit when we're getting ready um, to maybe take our six weeks assessment or something like that. So power hour is basically when your entire math time is spent doing small groups. You might have like a quick like five to 10 minute mini lesson towards the beginning just to kind of quickly review. But then after that, you're gonna break up into your small group rotations and that's what you're gonna spend your entire time doing. And that is when your core teaching is going to take place would be during that time. So like I mentioned, I know teachers who like to teach this way all the time. And then me personally, I'd like to do it like every once in a while, just to get ready to review maybe for an upcoming assessment. All right, now we are gonna talk about how to create that vision um, for setting up small groups in your classroom. All right, so first we're gonna talk about your whole group instruction, <clears throat> excuse me. So I mentioned that it needs to, your whole group lesson needs to stay between 20 and 30 minutes. <clears throat> At the beginning of the year, so that's what you see BOY here means beginning of the year, I keep it around 30 minutes and then towards the middle of the year and the end of the year, I like to cut it down to 20 minutes. That way, that extra amount of time can go towards my small groups. During my whole group lesson, I like to keep things simple. I don't really, I don't really over plan. I don't incorporate a lot of acti activities during that time. I like to do things such as creating whole class anchor charts like you see here. And anytime we're creating an anchor chart whole group, my kids are also going to be creating that exact same chart in their math journal so that they're staying actively engaged the entire time. We might be doing work with manipulatives or whiteboards or doing some sort of activity in our math journals or interactive notebooks. So my whole group lessons, I keep very simple and then I try to dig, um, dive in and dig into the deeper content at the small group table. So once that our whole group lesson is over, that's when we are going to move into our math station rotations. I use 15 minutes for each rotation, like I mentioned previously. And so this is kind of the setup of what that lesson looks like. And you're gonna see me dive deeper into these three components here in just a little bit, but this is what it looks like. I do a quick warm up that's normally anywhere from two to three minutes. This is going to be something that I can quickly do to review a previously taught skill followed by some time for guided practice. And this is where we are focusing on the activity, or excuse me, focusing on the skill that we are currently learning. And then I do a quick wrap up anywhere from like three to four minutes. And that's where I'm having students reflect or write about what we just did. And you'll see some examples of that here in just a little bit. All right, so let's talk about um, your rotation setup. This is what my rotation board looks like. Now, I'm will gonna say this is something that works for me. It's what I have used in my classroom. I've used this same rotation board in this same setup for about seven years. There are lots of different types of rotation systems out there. Make sure that you choose something that works for you and your students. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through what my board looks like. So I have a total of five groups. I have had more or less, um, depending on the number of students in your classroom. All of my students are grouped by ability, and we'll talk about that a little later on as well. And then you're going to wanna have anywhere from five to six stations that your kids can rotate through weekly. 
I have always had either five or six. So my rotation board that you see here includes five. Um, whenever I have had six in the past, I've had these same five stations. And then I also add one that is specifically for math facts. You just kind of have to pick and choose what you feel like is best for your students. So how my rotation board works is I like to use animals just because younger kids, they think that it's fun. So my lions that you see here, my lions are always my group that are going to be like my low or struggling re or my low or struggling students. My gorillas are my low to average kids. My pandas and tigers are going to be my average to average high kids and then my monkeys are always like my high my higher thinking students. And so how I do it is I try to make sure that I see my low and my low average students every day, for sure my lowest group. They always come to me first every single day. And then normally I'll see my average students and then my high students every other day. And we'll talk about um, how that works here in just a second. So again, this is my rotation board. Um, I have five different stations and I keep them simple. They're just called station one, station two, station three, technology, and meet with the teacher. So what kind of activities should you include? One of another question that I get asked a lot is they say, how do you have time to prep five or six games that you have to print and laminate and cut out and just prep every single week? And my answer is I don't. So a lot of times I like to incorporate activities such as interactive notebooks or crafts that I don't get, that I normally don't have time to do during my whole group time. So um, one of my favorite things to incorporate is going to be crafts like this one that you see here. Because I am one, I like to do crafts with my kids, but a lot of times people are like, when do you have time to do this? So once I feel like a concept has been mastered, I will put an example craft that's already created and set up. I will put an example of that into a basket with all of the pieces. And then as students rotate to that particular station, then they can create that craft on their own. A lot of times I'll also incorporate interactive notebook activities for our math journal, like you see here. So this is also something that requires very little prep. Other things that you can include, um, like you can see mentioned hands-on learning, lots of games and open-ended activities, group or partner work. And now I'm gonna kind of break down um, a little bit of what each station looks like. So as I mentioned um, earlier, I used to have six, six different rotations and I kind of felt like that was a little too much to keep up with. So I decided to take my math facts station and I changed that to where math facts is always station one because no matter what grade level you're in, whether you are, whether you teach kindergarten or whether you teach third grade, I know in second grade, you're still gonna have those kids that come to you and they still need that basic practice with addition and subtraction. And that's something maybe like once the first couple of weeks pass in the school year, you don't really go but get to go back and touch on it. So one of my stations is always either basic addition and basic subtraction. You can use a mix of like pre-printed, like prepped games like you see here, or you can easily toss some, some manipulatives into a tub and let them work problems out using a whiteboard and some sort of manipulative like you see here. Stations two and three are always a review of a previously taught skill. So this is going to be something that I know my students have already mastered. That way um, I know that they can probably do it independently. So station one is always math back practice. Stations two and three are always a review of some sort of previously taught skill. 
Now we're going to talk about technology and I'm going to show you a couple of different websites that I have used in my class. This first one, you are more than likely probably familiar with it, but if you are not, abcyacht.com is fabulous. It is a free website. There is even an app that you can download onto your tablet. And so with this website, there are several different grade levels that you can choose from. It's very, very kid friendly. Most of the games don't require like you to come and help or anything like that. A lot of times I'll pull up the game that they might be playing for the week up on um, like up on my board and I'll just kind of quickly show it one time. And then once I've showed it, most of the time they're good to go. So this is a great one that I always recommend for parents too. The next one is mathgames.com. This is an excellent free website. Now this website is going to require you to create a login. And then once you have registered, then you can create like individual accounts for your students. There are several different games that you can pick from or different grade levels that you can pick from. And then once you have done that, then you can select the subject. And then once you've selected the subject, you can see here all the different types of questions that you can, that kids can solve based on concept. So mathgames.com is a great one. Another one of my favorites is conacademy.org. This is very, very similar to Math Games. It um, will require you to create a login and then you will create a login for your students. And then you can track their progress. But what I like about this is that the questions that you see that they are gonna be asked, they're more in that like standardized testing format that they're probably gonna see maybe on like a benchmark or a six or nine week assessment, or especially when they get to third grade when they're getting ready to take their first standardized test. So this, this is a great one. All right, the next website is mathlearningcenter.org. What I like about this one is you may recognize a lot of these little icons if you have iPads or tablets in your classroom. So not only are these free internet like web programs that you can use, but they're also free apps that your students can download. So from here you can see if it says open web app, that means that you can pull the G this GeoBoard app, you can pull it up on the main screen in your classroom and kids can use it on a computer or you can see here where you can download it um, in the Apple iTunes store or if you have Chromebooks or things like that. So this is a great free resource. And this is just kind of showing you an example of that. This was using 10 frames. So they can pull different 10 frames, um, maybe say they're using flashcards. And so they're gonna draw a flashcard, they're gonna build, the two add-ins on the 10 frames and then they have to solve for the sum. So that's a quick and easy low prep activity that you can do. All right, and then another favorite way to incorporate technology is by using QR codes. So if you have a tablet or any type of smart device in your classroom, you're gonna have access to QR codes. And something that I just recently learned, maybe like a month or two ago, that now your iPhone, I have the iPhone XR, it's like the newest iPhone, but I know that this also works with the iPhone 8. But now the your camera that is like the standard camera that is on, that comes with your phone is a QR code reader. So you can scan the QR code and then the answer will pop up on the screen. I did not know that until recently. Um, but if you don't have um, like a smartphone, you can download any type of QR code app on your device. Most of them are free. And so what they'll do is they use a task card like you see in this example here. And so the, here they would solve for the sum 
and then they can scan this little funny looking box type thing right here. They can scan that code with the app and then the answer will pop up. So it makes this activity self checking. And so like this particular one that you see here, if they got their answer correct, and then, then they got to color in the little star on their recording sheet. So that's just another kind of fun way to incorporate technology. All right, and then now we're gonna talk about what do kids do when they're done? Because you're always going to have that one kid or maybe more than one kid that's gonna finish whatever activity you're doing very quickly. And you don't want kids coming up to you while you're at the small group table, tapping on your shoulder saying, Miss Brandy, I'm done now, what do I do? What do I do next? Can I do this, can I do that? Because you don't want your time at the small group table interrupted. So I keep a poster, it looks just like this. Oh, sorry, let me go back. It looks just like this. I have it laminated and it was um, stapled next to my rotation board. And I would just write some kind of simple open-ended activity that one, it's gonna be some type of incentive that the kids aren't normally going to get to do. And I want it to be open-ended to where they're not going to run out of time before it's time um, to switch and go to the next rotation. So whenever kids, if they finish whatever their activity they're supposed to be completing, if they finish before it's time to switch or time is up, then they know that they have to do the activity on the I'm done, now what chart. And at the end of this webinar, I'm gonna give you um, a link, and I know that Rochelle mentioned it at the beginning, but I'm gonna direct you to where you can find um, this resource. It's a free one in my TPT store. All right, so now we're gonna talk about, well, what do I do at the teacher table? So I mentioned earlier that my small group lessons consist of three different components. I do a warm up that covers a previously taught skill, guided practice that focuses on our current concept and then a quick reflection. I keep a guided math binder at, on my small group table at all times. And inside that guided math binder, you're gonna find my simple like lesson plan template. This is something that I had for myself. I don't have to turn these into my administration or anything like that. I basically would just write down what activity I'm gonna do to review. Then I'm gonna write down the activities that I'm doing for my guided practice. And then I'm just writing down what I want them to reflect. Because when you have five or six groups, it sometimes you get kind of like confused and mixed up of what you're teaching with this group. So it just kind of helps me stay on track. I write the standards down that I'm covering. I write the dates of that week, the concept that I'm covering and what group I'm focusing on. So the next thing I wanna show you is I often get asked, well, what, like, what do you do at the teacher table? What do you do for your like core teaching? So I decided to create this to help out teachers. It is a small group math activity guide. And what I love about this is that it includes over 70 like simple, easy activities that you could implement in your classroom tomorrow. These are gonna be activities that you aren't gonna to have to prep. They require things that you already have, maybe such as dice or whiteboards or any type of manipulative. Now, I will say that this particular guide right here covers only the second grade standards. But if you are a first grade teacher or a third grade teacher, you can take these activities and you can easily change them out to meet the needs of your students. So in this guide, you're gonna find um, two to like five different activities for every single second grade math concept. You will get the link at the end of this webinar, or you can type this bit.ly link down here, bit.ly slash small group math activity guide. If you type that into your browser, it's gonna, you're gonna see how you can grab that. 
or you can head on over to my blog, saddleupforsecondgrade.com. And on the home page, if you scroll down like just a little bit, you're gonna see a box that looks just like this. And it's gonna say small group math instruction made easy. If you just type your name and your email address, then this activity guide is gonna be sent automatically to your inbox. So that's another way that you can grab it. All right, now we're gonna talk about what I do for a reflection. This is something that I do not only for small group math, I do it for all different subjects. I learned this from my mentor teacher, my very first year teaching, and it just kind of stuck with me. So I just keep like a little brown paper sack, or you could use like a little bucket or tin, you know, that you can find in the Target dollar spot or a little basket. And inside that basket, I'm gonna have a whole bunch of paper clips and rubber bands, puzzle pieces and erasers. And so when it comes time for a reflection, the kids are gonna reach in to the bag or the bucket or whatever you have, and they're gonna pull out one of the items. Whatever they pull out, that is what they have to reflect on. So say you're gonna have a student draw a puzzle piece. Maybe they are going, they can either orally tell you or you can have them write in their math journal or on a, um, on a dry erase board. Maybe something that they're still struggling with or something that they find is still hard. Maybe if they draw the eraser, then they have to explain, okay, well, maybe this didn't work for me this time, so I'm gonna try this strategy next time. If they draw the rubber band, they're gonna tell me something that stretched their thinking, what challenged them. And if they draw a paper clip, they are going to write or tell me something that added to their knowledge, something new that they learned. So this is a, a great way um, for students to reflect on their learning. And like I said, you can do this either during your small group time or you can do it at the end whole group. And maybe you just choose maybe like one or two students to come in and kind of share their knowledge. All right, now we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk all about planning and organization. All right, so teachers, most of us, we like to plan ahead. And so this is where my guided math finder, that comes in. My guided math finder is kind of like my saving grace when it comes to um, keeping everything organized. Because if you are anything like me, I am like notorious for losing a piece of paper. If I lay it down somewhere, if I don't put it in its right spot, it's probably gonna be sucked into that like teacher vortex and and I'm gonna lose it or it's gonna get thrown away or I'm gonna spill something on it. So if I keep it in my binder, at least I most of the time know where it is. So I use this type of planning page to schedule out my activities at the beginning of every month. So I write out what I'm gonna do for stations one, two, and three, and then I list the website or activity that they're gonna be using for technology. And what I like about this is that once I have everything planned out, then I save it in the following year, I know I can open up my math finder and I can say like, hey, last May, this is what I did the first week. This is what I did the second week. And one, you know that you're already gonna have those activities prepped. So um, you know that you're probably not gonna have to plan anything new, or it's gonna allow you to see Maybe, hey, I didn't like this from last year. I'm gonna kind of change it up. And so then once I have that planning page filled out, I use a simple checklist that looks like this. And so I write down all of the stations that I know that needed prepped. And I can either prep them myself or a lot of times um, I will ask a parent volunteer to do this kind of stuff for me. And so I will, once it's printed, I check it off. And once it's laminated and ready to go, I mark it down as well. If there are any kind of books that I need to pull, because I like to incorporate reading into my math block, I'll write those down. If I need to pull any kind of anchor charts or websites that I need, I know that I need to bookmark on 
the iPads or on my desktop computers, I write that down to make sure that it is done. So I also will like to plan ahead, basically just kind of creating a month at a glance. So I write down what topics I know that I want to focus on with my kids. I'll write down review topics for each group that I know maybe that um, kids need to be working on. And then I'll do like a quick little, um, I'll write like a little sentence or two about what I wanna focus on each week with my students. All right, now we're gonna kind of dig in and we're gonna talk all about establishing those procedures to help you get started. Oh, there was a fly, sorry. Okay, so um, just like anything else, guided math takes time and patience to get started. But once you start the process and your students develop that routine, it is highly beneficial. So one thing I suggest is having a set of rules that you're gonna post somewhere in your classroom. This is a set that I've created and I will drop the link to these um, at the end of the webinar because this is a free, both of these posters, they're free in my Teachers Pay Teachers store. But I post these and especially like the first five weeks of teaching my students how to implement stations into our day, I'm referring to these rules constantly. Um, and then I'm also referring to them throughout the year as well. And then once our rules are established, I teach something called ask three before me. This is something I do throughout my day. It's not something that is just specifically for my stations, but I will choose three students who I feel are responsible students. I know that they can follow directions. And if any, it, at any time, if a kid has a question or maybe they're confused on how to do something or they're not sure about something, they have to ask those three students for help before they can come to me and interrupt me at the small group table. Voice levels is something you are also going to want to incorporate. If you're not familiar with voice levels, this is something that I use throughout the day. It's very simple and I, um, I really like this classroom management strategy. So I'm gonna kind of quickly just review them. So if at any time we are working at a level zero, that means it is quiet time, that there should be no talking during that time. Level one is gonna be a whisper type voice. It's gonna be something that maybe they can do if they're working maybe with a partner or somebody that's sitting right next to them. Level two is going to be a partner voice where they're just kind of talking in a normal, regular voice. Table three is going to be for table talk. This is when you have to teach them how to talk when they are working with a group. Because if you have your kids broken up into groups and all of your kids are yelling and talking and screaming at the same time, we know that that is not going to work. So teaching them how to work in just in a quiet voice within individual groups is important. Level four is speaker. That is going to kind of be like what the teacher the what your voice would sound like or if somebody was reading or um, in front of the class their voice is going to be a little bit higher and then level five is going to be like their outside recess voice so with this i have a large chart posted um, again near my math station rotation board and then i use a clothespin clip like you see here to move up and down to represent the levels so this particular chart um, that I created, I just printed it really small to fit in a five by seven, like those plastic frames that you can find at the dollar store. And then I use a clothespin to move up and down to represent what voice level we're currently working with. And so I have one set at each table or um, if you don't have tables, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have a designated spot for each, 
for each station in your classroom. So station one is gonna always go to the same spot. Station two is always gonna go to the same spot. And so you can keep a voice level chart there just as a visual reminder of how they should be working. You're also going to want to make sure that you have something to use as a signal or some sort of noise maker that you're gonna to use to make transitions and getting their attention easy. So a lot of teachers use a bell like this. You can use some sort of chime or maybe some sort of clapper. I started using two years ago, I started using a wireless doorbell and it was a total game changer for me as far as classroom management. So this right here, you can see this is the base and it just plugs into an outlet. And then this remote right here, you could keep it like in your pocket, you could attach it to your lanyard or just kind of keep it somewhere near where you always are. And so this particular bell, it had, I believe it has three different volume levels and it's very loud so your kids can hear it. And then it had like over 50 different chimes. So whenever I wanted to get their attention, all I would do is press the button and it would go like ding dong. And the kids knew that when they heard that particular noise, they had to stop what they're doing and turn and face me to listen to directions. So if you are interested in this particular type of um, doorbell, you can check it out and find it in my, I have an Amazon storefront. So if you type in this bit.ly link, bit.ly slash saddle up Amazon, and you click on classroom favorites, you will find, um, you can find the exact link to the one that I have. All right. Now we're going to talk about math tubs. Math tubs are an, is another thing. It was a total game changer in my classroom. So prepping student manipulatives takes a lot of time. And as teachers, we don't have a lot of time to spare. So my second year teaching, I created math tubs. I bought plastic like shoebox size containers from the dollar store. And inside each tub, excuse me, inside each tub, there are individual bags of student manipulatives. On the lid for each tub, there is a label like you can see here, and it tells the students exactly how many of each manipulative they should have. So they should, have, example, they should have three hundreds blocks, 20 tens blocks, 20 ones blocks, one clock, 20 unifix cubes, so anytime I needed manipulatives for something, whether it was a whole group lesson or something for small groups or for stations, I was never having to prep manipulatives because they could always use the individual ones in their tubs. So they are, these kids are 100% in charge of them. So after we finish an activity, I say, okay, look at your label. How many Unifix cubes should you have? And if they don't have 20, they know they need to look on the floor, they need to check with the neighbor. And then I also have group, um, like whole group manipulatives that they can use also. But this, this was a total game changer for me. And honestly, I created these my second year teaching. I created them that first, that first year. And since then, my students have been 100% in charge. So the first week of school, when I introduce the tubs, we go through, kids take out each bag, we count each one, make sure they have everything that's needed. And then they keep up with it throughout the year. Then at the end of the year, like right now, this would be a great thing you could have your students prep for next year. So we, I have them go through and they count out each manipulative. We make sure they have the right amount and then it's ready to go for the beginning of the year next year. And um, also at the end, I'm gonna um, drop a link and you will see where you can get this uh, Math Tub label is a free printable on my blog. All right, so I often get asked, how do students turn in their work? So I've done two different ways. Each kid is going to have a math station folder. And then I'm also gonna provide you a link with this printable as well. And so this folder they're going to use for any type of printable work that they have. So all of their unfinished work goes on one side and then 
their finished work, once they complete something, is going to go on the finished work side. I never grade station work. I will look at it, but most, I never take a grade on it. And then at the end of the week or every couple of weeks, they take their finished work and then they, they just take it home with them. So they keep up with this and it just travels with them from station to station. Another simple and easy way that if you kind of want to control the paper chaos is to use these plastic sleeves. These are like one of my favorite classroom must-haves. You, um, you can find them like at Target, you can get them on Amazon. So what I'll do, instead of running off a class set of answer sheets, I'll just run off like maybe six and then they can place the answer sheet inside the plastic sleeve and then they can solve with a dry erase marker. And then when time is up, they can either come and show me their work or if you have student iPads or a class iPad or a tablet or something like that, they can take a picture of their work and then you can go back and look at it whenever you have time. But my favorite way to um, collect work is through an online app and website called Seesaw. It is an online student portfolio and it is amazing. Like I, I absolutely love it. So you go in, it's free, you create an account and it's really, it's kind of like, like a classroom Facebook almost. So what kids can do is they have their own individual accounts so here you can see they just took a picture of the recording sheet and then they use like a stylus or their finger and then they just wrote the answer to the question on their iPad or on the iPad and then when time is up they can save their work to their portfolio. So then at the end of the week or you know after stations are over and it's my conference time I can go in and I can look at their portfolio and I can check their work. So from there, I can even like type a little comment and I can say like, hey, Johnny, like you did really great with um, A or for with questions A and L or hey, Samantha, you have improved so much. Like I'm so proud of you. So you can type comments back and forth with the kids. So that's another great way that students can turn in their work and you're controlling the chaos, the, the paper. All right, now we're going to talk about how you can create your student groups and how you can easily um, differentiate for your groups. So when it comes time to be doing like full blown guided math, and then I'm going to talk to you about a five week process here in just a minute. But when it comes time for creating your student groups, you're going to want to make sure um, to plan out, you know, how many groups do you want to have? I normally had anywhere from five to six. And then you're going to want to figure out how many students do you want to have in each group. I recommend having like no less than four and no more than six students in a group if you can manage that. And I normally have anywhere from five to six groups. Remember that flexibility is key. So this is where I use my guided math binder and I'll just use like little bitty sticky notes. Um, and I will write names on each sticky note. That way I can easily move groups around if needed, but it's in my binder. It's right there for me to always, to always have. Now there are two different ways that you can group your kids. You can do mixed ability or same ability grouping. Mixed ability grouping is good in ways because I am kind of a firm believer that kids often learn better from one another rather than a teacher. So you could group your kids um, maybe like high, pair like some high and average and low students all together. And then you're going to have your students that have different strengths and weaknesses helping each other through rotations. And then you as the teacher, you can either float around from small group to small group and help out or you can just pull different kids at a time to the teacher table. Or you can choose to do same ability grouping. This is what I like to do because I like to target instruction based on student needs. And so um, during this time, I mean, the teacher table is always going to be a rotation for them. 
All right, differentiation doesn't necessarily have to be hard. So I'm gonna show you um, a couple of different ways how you can easily differentiate with your, um, with your kids. So a lot of times, if you have ever purchased any type of resource on Teachers Pay Teachers, you're probably familiar with what task cards are. If you're not, these, this is what they are. They're just little individual cards that have um, different types of problems. So you can use the same set of task cards, but use into, um, different types of recording sheets with your group. So here, for example, your low kids might just be working on just counting the value of these base 10 blocks, where your high kids are going to be finding, counting the number and writing it in, in multiple ways, such as the number form, expanded form, and word form. So it's the same set of cards, but they're working on different skills. And how I keep track of all this is I use a color coding system. You can use any three colors in your classroom. I choose to use um, orange, green, and blue. And so kids um, in each group, they know what their color is. And then for recording sheets, I'll just stick a little colored dot on the bag so they know um, what sheet they need to grab. So most of the time I will use orange for my low students. Green, the green activities are gonna be for my like average kids. And then if it's in blue, it's gonna be for my higher kids. So you can see here, this activity is, it's the same one or it's the same type of activity, but the values of the numbers are going to be different. So here, um, like my orange group, they might be working on sums to 10, green is working on sums to 15, and blue is going to be working on sums to 20. And then I also keep them labeled down here at the bottom, so in case they're not ran off on colored copies, that um, you can't, they can, kids can easily tell, um, tell the sets apart. And now it comes down to organizing all that data. What do you do with the recording sheets? What do you do with the information that you're learning at the small group table? So in my binder, I keep a sheet like this with um, strengths, concerns, and notes that I like to take for each individual student. This is great for, um, you know, documenting how um, how student progress is coming. You can share it um, in parent meetings, you can share it in RTI meetings or with your administrator. So I keep everything organized all in one place. And then I like to jot down maybe, hey, they did really well on this activity or maybe they didn't do so well in what you wanna focus on with them the next time. All right, and now we're gonna talk about making sure your space is just set up. It's very user friendly. So you wanna make sure that you have some sort of displayed rotation board, a visual for your students to see whether you have it on a bulletin board or on a digital screen. And then you're gonna to wanna to have baskets or drawers or some type of place where all of your stations um, are held and you want to make sure that they're labeled so that um, kids don't get things mixed up. You're going to want to have your commonly used supplies all in one place for easy access. So you can see these are mine here. And these little baskets that you see here, they just hold dice and dry erase markers, spinners, things like that. Remember, they're using their math tubs to hold all of their manipulatives. So I don't really have um, a designated space for that. And then you can see these tubs these plastic sterilite tubs down here. You're probably a way better teacher than me and you maybe have like a cute little label on there. I don't have cute labels on mine. <laughs> They're just plain. Um, but that's where I store all of my monthly math stations. Um, what do I keep um, all of my materials in? I'm like real simple and maybe because I'm, I'm cheap, but I store all of my activities in pieces either in a Ziploc bag or a laminated manila folder. And then all the pieces for each activity go inside either the bag or the folder. For long-term storage, again, I use these Sterilite containers. 
So down here, like all of my monthly mass stations say for April are in one container. All the ones for May are in another container. But again, maybe you're better than me. Mine aren't labeled. Sorry. And then I use these, uh, I have a storage cart like this. These can be found like at Michael's, I think. I got mine at, um, at Sam's Club. It was relatively cheap. I think it was like $25-ish. And so you can kind of, I actually have these labeled, but here you can see, so all of my edition games are in one drawer. All of my shape or all of my games that cover time are in another drawer. So it's just kind of all in one designated space. And then I did mention that I do have tubs um, full of manipulatives. These are just clear plastic shoebox containers. They're labeled with some sort of picture label. And these sit on a shelf behind my small group table. These are mainly for me because students have their math tubs. But if a kid ever needed something that wasn't in their math tub or they need to refill their math tub, they know that they can come here um, and use anything out of these tubs. All right, and then the last thing I'm gonna share with you is I often get asked, well, how do you assess your students when, you know, when it comes to small groups? And honestly, it's all thanks to our fabulous and wonderful host, ESGI. If you um, are not signed up with ESGI, let me just tell you, I used ESGI last year in my classroom, and it, when I say it was a game changer, I'm telling you the truth. I would not promote something that I did not 100% believe in. So if I wanted to assess my students, you know, normally if you're giving them some sort of like paper pencil task, one, it might take them like 20 or 30 minutes per kid to do it. Maybe um, you have to sit down, you have to grade it. With ESGI, it's not like that. All of the questions are simple yes or no questions. So you can see down here, um, on the sides and across the bottom. So the kids are gonna answer um, questions orally. So here, they would have to read the time shown on the clock. If they got it right, you're just gonna hit yes. If they got it wrong, you're gonna hit no. And then you can, there's even a space where you can type a little note. And what I love about this is one, it's instantly graded for me. I don't have to grade, and I don't know about you guys, but I don't like to grade papers. Um, it is going to instantly create a parent letter for me that was available in English and in Spanish. It's going to explain to the parents what they were assessed on. It's going to show them the questions that they got right and the questions that they got wrong. I can instantly take data sheets and print off that are going to include graphs and charts that I can take to RTF meetings. I can show in parent meetings. I can show to my administrators. And then the best thing is there are over a thousand pre-made assessments already. And I mean, I fell in love with ESGI so much that I decided to partner with them and become a friend of ESGI. And so what I did was I created um, second grade math assessments for every single math standard. And you can see them listed here. And so each, each um, assessment is gonna have anywhere from like two I would say 10 questions at the most. And you can easily inset, assess your entire class in maybe an hour. And it's all graded for you. All of your data is done. Your parent letters are ready to go, saving you hours and hours of time. So if you are not signed up with ESGI, if you have never tried it before, I would like to encourage you to head on over to ESGI.com um, after the, um, the webinar is over. And you can sign up for a free trial. With that free trial, if you use the code saddle up, I would greatly appreciate it. And then it's also going to, um, it'll give you a 60 day free trial. So it's perfect for assessing your students at the end of the year. And then also if you decide to purchase the software, um, it is going to give you, um, save you $40. And so at the end of this webinar, for all of my people that are still with me, they're gonna give away um, some free one year subscription. So make sure you stay tuned for that. And last but not least, I wanna first, I wanna thank everybody for sticking here with me. So now you're probably thinking like, oh my gosh, she just shared so much information. How do I take that information and implement it into my classroom? 
So I am super excited to share with you that I have a five week guide to share with you. This is something that can be used for any grade level, not just second grade. So um, if you go to this website, and like I said, it will also be um, included in the handout. But if you go to bit.ly slash launching guided math, you can sign up and this guide will be delivered straight to your inbox. It's gonna include what you need to do with your kids for the first 25 days of implementing guided math. It's gonna walk you through what you need to do with day one all the way through day 25. It's a very simple step-by-step -step guide just for you and I'm super excited to share it with you guys. So make sure you head on over to this link to download it and head it straight to your inbox. And then last but certainly not least, you can head on over um, to this link down here at the bottom, bit.ly slash managing math stations ESGI. And you can download a this handout. It's going to be in PDF form and it is going to include clickable links. Everything that I shared with you today, I more than likely have a blog post about it. So you can click on each individual blog post to take you to that if you want to go back and reference something. All of the freebies that I referenced during um, this webinar, you can click here to download. And then if there was a paid resource that I referenced, you can click there too. Then there's also clickable links to find me on social media. You can check out my blog, find me on Instagram or Facebook. I would love to connect with you guys. If you have any kind of questions, please, please, please do not hesitate. Send me an email um, at saddleupforsecondgrade at gmail.com and I am happy to answer your questions for you. Thank you so, so much for being here with me tonight. I had a blast sharing my passion with you guys and I hope you have a great night.